Brilliant. So I think um, we'll go ahead and make a start. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining this Risk Minds webinar on balancing the digital promise with risk. My name is Eleanor, producer of Risk Minds. It's great to have everybody joining us today as part of our Risk Minds Digital Week. Before I hand over, I would like to encourage you all to submit questions to our presenters through an R. You will ask a question module on your screen. We will try to address as many of these as possible throughout. There are also sharing icons for you to pass the message on and a resource list of other recommended content relating to this webinar. Also, if you do know of people who couldn't make it to this live presentation but would have liked to have joined, the webinar will be available on demand afterwards. So now to begin, I'd like to welcome our presenters and introduce you all to Brad Carr, Managing Director of Digital Finance at the Institute of International Finance, and Yaka Gribbler, Chief Risk Officer at First Rand Bank. Welcome both. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Brad F first, who will kick things off. So Brad, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Eleanor. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we appreciate you making the time. And most importantly, we hope you're all keeping safe and healthy through this challenging and unprecedented time. Uh, and indeed, the fact that events like this, like what a lot of what we see from Risk Minds, uh, have adapted to the virtual world is in some way perhaps a little bit analogous or, uh, or a bit of a microcosm for some of what we're going to talk about across the broader sphere of digital transformation in today's session. Uh, I might start actually by recapping a little bit from a discussion that Jaco and I had back at the time of Risk Minds International in Amsterdam last December. Uh, and at that time, uh, Jaco and I, together with my colleague Richard Gray and also Peter Deans, the former CRO from the Bank of Queensland, uh, we recorded a podcast capturing our key takeaways from Risk Minds. And, uh, and obviously at that time, climate risk really stood out as a, a major new emerging issue. I guess that's been somewhat overshadowed by the developments we've seen since December uh, with COVID. But the second and third issues we identified were about the, the conduct risk associated with data and the ethical use of data. And the, the third was about uh, execution risk associated with, with transformation projects. Uh, and there were a couple of great panels within the Risk Minds International Conference on, on that specific topic. So we're going to carry forward, I think, some of the discussion from that time and some of the emerging themes that we saw from that conference into what we talk about today. But we're also going to do so in the context of a, a recent study that the IAF has undertaken with Deloitte, uh, looking at the barriers and enablers of digital transformation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that project and that series of reports just in a moment. Uh, but I'm very pleased that, that as we interviewed 80 plus executives and leaders around the world for that, uh, that analysis, Yako was one of those. And so I'm pleased that where I can bring some of the, the studies findings today, Yako was able to complement that firstly from a first-hand practitioner's perspective and secondly and most importantly from that of a, a risk perspective uh, in his capacity as a Chief Risk Officer. Um, so the intent as we go through, and I might just uh, bring up the, the agenda of what we're going to cover here for you, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the first, uh, our first report we did with Deloitte on uh, the challenges in digital transformation. We'll then secondly move on to the key enablers for transformation, and we'll thirdly talk a bit about how COVID impacts that. On each of those three items, I'll give a bit of a snapshot um, or share some of the takeaways or insights that most resonated for me out of the report. And on each of those three, I'm going to stop and pause and, and turn to Yako, and he's going to be able to share some of his insights um, from that first-hand practitioner, risk practitioner perspective. We're then going to flip it over uh, and talk about a big paradigm shift where Yako, you may have seen, has, uh, has published a great book identifying uh, a number of the new mega trends. And I'm really impressed that he actually wrote this pre-COVID yet so much of what he talks about in that is very, very much relevant, and I think probably all the more so from what we've seen emerge uh, in the last four or five months. So I'll let Yako talk through that, and, and I'll react to, to some of his findings there. And then lastly, we'll talk a bit about death, data ethics and conduct and probably draw together some of the, the strands of, of what we've talked about along the way. Um, as we do so, and we've called this session Balancing the Digital Promise with Risk, um, realising the digital promise being the, the series that the IF and Deloitte have produced. I think probably some of what you'll see are, are cases where, yes, there is perhaps a balance of innovation or experimentation and risk. And in other cases, it's perhaps not a balance at all and rather a reinforcement or a compounding effect. And I guess to, to that note, if I come to, to give you a quick snapshot of the, the structure of our series of reports. 
So the first report was published in, uh, in February, uh, identifying the top nine challenges, which we'll go to in just a moment. The second report, which was just published two weeks ago, talks about some of the key enablers from an internal perspective. What can banks and insurers themselves be doing to overcome some of those challenges? A third one that we'll subsequently deliver will look more at the external ecosystem, the regulators, the investors and the like, and where there's uh, other things that need to be done externally to help the transformation agenda. But across those, um, if I can call out a couple of key themes um, that, that really resonate for me uh, from our discussions, and I, I want to give a shout out here in particular to Michael Tang and Puneet Kakar of the, the Deloitte team who have been great leaders and great partners in this exercise. Um, one theme I, I think that, that resonates is that, that digital, digitalization is not an option. It's an essential and it's about keeping pace. It's required to be customer centric. It's required to keep pace with the way that customers' expectations have, have changed and evolved. Secondly, that, that as we get as we went through speaking with with over eighty executives, no one really mentioned technology. It's it's very much more the in terms of the barriers, in terms of the challenges, and how you overcome that. The dominant part of each conversation has been about a lot of the human elements, far more so than than uh, issues of the technology itself. I wrote a short supplement uh, on LinkedIn uh, attached to this study um, at, at the time that we first went into quarantine or lockdown in the case of the US uh, in, in late March, um, in which you know, I think our observation was the technology is working, but the humans are still learning to work with it. Uh, and that's certainly a theme we've, we've seen emerge. And the third mega theme, I think, out of the, the conversations we've had is that, that COVID uh, accelerates catalyzes, uh, it adds to the criticality of digital transformation. A bit of what we'll cover today will be the cases where it helps to perhaps be a catalyst to overcome some of the blockages, but it makes it all the more critical as, as suddenly, in a lot of cases, the world has digitalised overnight. Uh, Martin Gilbert, the chairman of, of uh, Aberdeen Standard Life Investments, uh, joined me on a webinar a couple of weeks ago where he made the observation that you know, we've made more uh, transformation progress in the last 10, uh, last 10 weeks than we have in the previous five years. Uh, and he gave a lot of credit to banks IT departments in achieving that. I'll make one more comment before I pause and, and invite Yako to, to react. Um, we've uh, done a fair bit of work at the IEF about cloud and the adoption of cloud computing across the industry and the, the barriers and the challenges to cloud. And I think probably the key thing that, that emerged in our initial research there was that we probably need to think less about the risk of cloud and more about the risk of not moving to cloud. And that specifically, uh, if you do not move to cloud, um, from a technical sense, you have to support older infrastructures, you have the issue of, of technology types and, and programming types where the skills maybe are not as, as readily available. So you have an operational risk, you have a security risk where arguably uh, your own infrastructure is not as secure as what the experts at Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud might be able to deliver. But I think more importantly, you've got the business risk that so much of what you need to be able to deliver in front-end applications and in how you support clients needs to be um, uh, aligned with the expectations that customers have from their experiences in other sectors. And invariably, you need cloud to be able to do that. And I bring that up just because I think that that cloud uh, issue, I think, is a bit of a microcosm itself or perhaps a bit of a, a broader um, metaphor, perhaps, almost for, for, for the broader issue of digital transformation that... Uh, I think it's it's increasingly, you, know, you, you need to be aware, obviously, of the risk profile of, of, uh, of all changes there. But I think increasingly it's about the risk of not doing it and not keeping pace, of being left behind and what that can mean to the future of your business. But look, why don't I pause there, um, having given that perhaps as a little bit of a, hopefully, a, an overview or a scene setter for the study we've done and some of the, the context of what we're going to discuss here. I'd like to invite Yako to, to add his thoughts or reflections to begin before we dive into the, the specific findings of the papers. Yako. Thank you, Brad. And thank you for the opportunity um, this discussion. I, I think you highlight a couple of very interesting points. Um, maybe the one I want to just add and give an example is the one of the technology being ahead of humans' ability to, to operate in a particular way. Um, and I think that's where the lockdown has proved incredibly interesting. Uh, to give you an example, in our organization, a, a lot of people probably would not believe that it's possible to work remotely. And many were still of the view that we need a separate building facility 
flexibility from a continuity perspective where people go in and work. And lockdown has actually proven that that all of that is a bit of a myth and you can actually work remotely. So the technology has been in place, but it has actually never been through a, let's call it a stress case to actually prove that it can actually uh, work very differently. Um, and, mm. and we'll get to some of that a bit later. So it, it, the analogy that I uh, use later in, in the slide deck is um, looking at the analog world, uh, moving towards a quantum world. Uh, if you look at that, you can't use analog transistors and technology right in a digital and a quantum world. They simply don't mix. Um, and the same goes for humans. Organizations have is they have many humans and employees who still think analog. They still think uh, confinement. They still think you need a desk. They still think you need the printer next to you. And, and it takes a big event um, to change that rapidly, or it takes a, a natural solution to change that. And, and what we're seeing currently is a almost like a massive cataclysmic uh, trigger event, changing that very rapidly. So I, I'm actually living in, in very exciting times from a, um, a digital transformation perspective. Uh, this is almost like a gift to us to, to, to move more rapidly into uh, the digital and the quantum world. I totally agree. Definitely. Uh accelerates and, and amplifies that uh, that push. And I think your point about the human adoption, it reminds me of, and apologies for anyone who's heard me say this before, it's a, it's a quote I've used a lot in the last couple of months. Uh, but uh, Ma Megan Green, uh, Harvard economist, uh, she actually made this comment at Risk Minds Americas last year, that, that generally when there is investments in new technology, it takes a long, long time to actually show up in productivity data, which obviously is what she as an economist is, is looking for. And in that occasion at Risk Minds America, she gave the specific example of how the advent of the PC took 25 years to show up at all in productivity data. Uh, her point being uh, that, that humans take time to, to learn, to, humans take time to adapt or learn how they can use a particular technology in its optimal fashion. And I think it's going to be really interesting to observe or reflect on this period right now and see whether or not this, this follows that same pattern or whether this is a circuit breaker where because it's been a forced adaptation. We've been forced to adapt. Uh, we haven't had the luxury of um, taking the, the longer lags that we often do and the longer lag that often goes from patent to commercialization. We've been forced to adapt this time that, that maybe this is a, a new phenomenon this time around that, that breaks that um, mold that she talks about. Yeah, I think absolutely. Um... I think we'll probably see a blend of a forced, very quick adoption and some more gradual um, change. Uh, um, and then Brad, let's quickly respond to one of the questions. Uh, it posted the question, which uh, I think is a very interesting topic. Is Do you think that technology and digital advances have made disaster recovery and business continuity sites completely redundant? Um, I think as far as a separate business continuity site is concerned, I, I think it, it has become redundant to a large extent. Um, and as an organization, we are actually going that way now. Uh, as far as your disaster recovery site from a primary data center is concerned, I don't think yet. I think uh, continued adoption of cloud will get us there. I don't think it will be as sudden as a, a, a business continuity. Uh... It's a great point and I think a, a great question. Um, and I think yeah, if I could add to that, you know, we, we saw uh, we had a, an IIF Chief Risk Officer Forum for Asia Pacific a few weeks ago and, and one of the CROs there of a multinational uh, Southeast Asian bank made the observation that they thought they'd been really clever in the past by setting up multiple disaster recovery sites. And unfortunately, those all turned out to be located in coronavirus hotspots. Uh, and so you know, none of them were able to provide the complete function without in some way threatening the safety of staff in, in some capacity. So I think it, it certainly pr prompts a, a rethink. Um, I agree with you, Yako, that it's, it's not to say that cloud is an overnight solution that's suddenly going to work for everybody and make those things completely redundant. 
Um, but it does emphasize the, the need for having versatility in your architecture and the ability to be able to switch or port in one way or another as, as needs may present. Yeah, most definitely. And I think another interesting development that we see is that your traditional, let's call it the views of the enterprise is also changing. So as an example, the, the, um, the data network of the bank will most likely extend to the employees, which is something that was completely inconceivable uh, a few months back. But now there's actually quite a solid business case for that. Um, so that's something that we're also busy working on. Hmm. So thanks for the, the great question that's come through there. And I will just give a quick reminder that you can submit your questions through to us via the, the Q&A uh, part. And, and as you've seen there, we will work those into the conversation as we go as best we can. What I'll do now is I'll, I'll jump along to the first part we wanted to talk about uh, from the, the series of reports that the IF and Deloitte have published. And that's from the firstly looking at the top nine challenges to transformation. Uh, and this is from the report that we published in February. And you can see that we've categorised there a number of these challenges that are internal in nature, but also others that are external. Um, and I'm going to talk through a few of these. Um, I won't necessarily cover all in detail, but, but let's pick out a few at least. Um, obviously, in the external side, you can see the top one was about investor expectations. And we heard some really interesting anecdotes here, for instance, from, from uh, one major European bank, for example, that cited that it took them, I think they said, seven years to be able to achieve their core banking system replacement project, where their investors would never have had the, the tolerance or the patience for that, for that length of project if, if it had been understood at the time that that was going to be the, the magnitude or the duration uh, of the initiative. Um, that there is perhaps a, a bias towards short-termism uh, from investors, which just doesn't have the patience for things that might have a, a longer run uh, payoff. There was a really interesting comment made by the chief innovation officer of one of the major American insurers, uh, which was that their investors have this expectation of a, a coupon-like return, like on a bond investment, and that that breeds, if I link it a little bit to an internal challenge, uh, an internal culture expectation then of, right, well, you know, we need to be pretty cautious and avoid experimentation or doing anything that may put that coupon at risk. Um, so there is a, a challenge there of whether the investor community, um, the perceptions from the investor community are, are maybe not as conducive for innovation and keeping pace in the way that in, inside the firm and in strategizing on the customer facing side may appear. Um, data regimes, I think, is a really important one. And, uh, and this is something we talk a lot about the IF and, and indeed that our board of directors has focused a lot on, where we have inconsistencies in the data regimes across borders and also across sectors. And again, I think we, we can't look at this without laying some sort of a COVID uh, element to it in that I think the ability to be able to port data across borders has become more important than ever in the last few weeks. Uh, and indeed that that's, uh, I think, one of the, the most critical items for us uh, as part of the, the business continuity solution. Um, but also that the inconsistencies in some cases between sectors, um, perhaps in some cases creates disadvantages for particular firms of what they can do with data relative to others. Um, and thinking of, of things like the asymmetries in open banking, where in an, under a number of, of jurisdictions or regimes, a customer can tell their bank, go and share my data with this other kind of firm, but it can't uh, dictate the, the symmetrical flow. The other one I want to talk a bit about here is about partnerships. And from the Singapore FinTech Festival in November, I thought overwhelmingly the number one theme there was about partnerships between financial institutions on one hand and FinTech firms or the likes on the, the other. And that this is increasingly critical as a way of bringing innovation to market through the, the major firms that have big extensive customer networks, but need to tap the innovative thinking from uh, the new startups and the FinTech firms. So I wanna link here external challenge three uh, together with internal challenge number two, in that I think this is very much two sides of the one coin. That on one hand, as you can see on the left there in the external challenges, a lot of the fintechs are not ready. Uh, not ready for partnering with a bank. They're not scalable, perhaps. Uh, they're not enterprise ready. In some cases, uh, we've heard anecdotes of, of a fintech who's come along with a, a proposition for a bank and the first thing they've said is, let's get rid of the terms and conditions. We don't need those. Nobody reads those. And the bank has had to explain, well, you know, that there are actually very good reasons and often legal re or regulatory requirements for those. 
So there's, I think, a learning curve, but also a, a substantive development part needed on the part of the, the fintech firms to be ready for what it is to partner with a risk-conscious and regulated bank. But on the other side of the same coin, the banks are often not ready for partnering with a fintech firm. Um, that culturally, perhaps, um, with their own internal processes, they can be slow and cumbersome. Uh, in some cases, they're not geared for the remuneration structure that a fintech firm might have in terms of how it's able to attract talent. Um, but also just, you know, and if, perhaps if I link together um, internal challenges two and three here, you know, we also have the issue where sometimes a bank or an insurer may perceive that there is a regulatory blockage or, or barrier. And that's actually more a function of their own internal assessment. Uh, Neil Cross, the former Chief Innovation Officer of DBS, uh, spoke at our uh, digital symposium uh, 18 months ago, and he made the point that so often we say regulation won't let us do this, and it's actually our internal interpretation of regulation uh, rather than the regulation itself. So I think we do have a, no a notion there that the banks or insurers on one hand and the fintechs on the other are not always as naturally geared or as prepared for, for the partnerships that they need to make. Uh, and that there is work to do on both sides to, to better accommodate that. Um, a couple of other points I'll make from the internal side. Uh, the first one you can see overwhelmingly was talent. And in some ways, this was a surprise to us and in other ways not. You know, I, I went into this exercise expecting to hear that the war for talent is an issue, the, the struggle or the ability to be able to attract and retain the right talent needed for um, competing and being effective in the digital economy. And what I heard overwhelmingly was was not about uh, attracting the talent, but it was specifically about retention. Uh, a number of people made the comment of, of look, we, we can attract the talent. We are a big firm uh, as a bank. We're able to, to pay competitively. Uh, we're able to offer people the opportunity to come and work with interesting, deep data sets. Chief Innovation Officer of, of one major US firm made the comment that, that we give really, really good apprenticeships because of those things, that someone can come and work with us with interesting tools and data sets and learn about an ethical use, ethical uh, way of using data. Um, but retaining is the much bigger challenge. And in some cases, that's because they don't actually provide the right cutting edge tools that the workers want to work with. Um, it's also perhaps about being able to demonstrate the sense of purpose that millennial workers may be looking for in an employer. And in some cases, it's also the element of remuneration uh, structures and the like. So that we overwhelmingly heard from chief digital officers and chief innovation officers in particular, this notion that, that specifically the retention of talent is a, a massive issue. And probably the other point I'll, I'll just mention here, you know, having already talked a little bit about the, the risk conscious culture and uh, I guess the, uh, the, the regulatory interpretations there, but perhaps if I can talk about the, the management ambition and, uh, and the focus on short-term targets. And again, I'll link this a little bit to the external side and, and investor expectations. Um, I thought it was one really pertinent comment that we heard from one chief innovation officer who has previously worked in banking and is now in insurance. And his observation was, look, this is a problem in both firms, but it's a bigger problem in banking or a bigger challenge in banking. Um, that because the nature of banking is lots and lots of customer engagements constantly, a much greater ability to churn your book uh, in a given year. Whereas in the case of insurance, um, and particularly if you have life insurance as a big chunk of your book, you may never interact with your client and you might only have the ability to churn 10% of your book in any given year. Um, so his observation was that, that in banking, I learned about P&L and in insurance, I learned about balance sheet. Um, and I thought that was just a really interesting nuance of how the the focus of short-term targets or short-term strategies, uh, probably more tactics than strategies, um, is an issue across the, the industry broadly, but perhaps a bit more of a challenge within banking um, than it is in insurance. Again, I'm going to pause at this point. Um, hopefully that sort of lays out some of, of what we saw as the, the major observations of the, the challenges. But Yako, from your perspective, what resonates or surprises perhaps for you amongst these? I think there's maybe one, just one point I want to make. Um, I think the short-term behaviour because of incentives and, and targets is, is a big challenge to systemically change the right direction. Um, however, I think what happening with COVID and the lockdown is, is for a period of, say, 18 months, maybe two years, investors will be less focused on ROE and short-term targets and more about efficiency and survival. 
And in that, I think it's a great opportunity um, to fast track a, a number of the digitization uh, initiatives. What we have certainly seen is that our digital channels has um, enabled and allowed us to deal quite well with, with, the, uh, with the lockdown. Um, and in fact, um, we are going to leverage that even more as part of the collection and the credit workout process going forward. So there's very strong imperatives to put more effort and energy into the digitization strategy at this point in time, I think, than, than there has ever been. Um, so, so I think those are important points to to note because, as they say, never waste a good crisis. And I think there's, there's plenty of opportunities here. I think that's the the really important takeaway. That, uh, and it's it's worth stressing that we wrote this report in February, and it was probably a really good snapshot of where the uh, the landscape of digital transformation has sat in somewhat more normal times and. You know, to your point, Yako, absolutely. You know, one of the things that COVID that COVID does is, is it gives a chance to shake up and, and break the nexus around you know, the internal inertia within the organisation, the inertia amongst some of the external counterparties as well, break up some of that entropy and, and you know, as a catalyst to get past particularly some of those internal challenges. So if we go on now to uh, some of the enablers, so in our second report that we published just a couple of weeks ago, we looked at what are some of the key enablers for overcoming those challenges. And uh, and what I want to talk about here firstly is on the, the leadership uh, and organisational foundation side. Uh, and overwhelmingly and consistently, we heard the story that you need to have a strong mandate from the CEO or the chairman uh, and ideally the board. Um, some talked a bit about the, the challenge of, of how much understanding there is on the board of technology and of digitalisation. Um, but I think a lot of, of you know, it was a, a really interesting conversation I had with a journalist about 18 months ago who, uh, as we were first thinking about doing this initiative, and I, uh, I've made the point that we needed to perhaps better understand the Chief Digital Officer or Chief Innovation Officer role, that that's called different things in different places. It perhaps has different reporting lines in different places. And this journalist made the observation to me of, yeah, and, and none of them stay in the job for very long, that there's a very, very high turnover rate amongst chief innovation or digital officers. And I initially challenged and pushed back on that, and I cited the example as, uh, in particular of Neil Cross at DBS that I mentioned earlier and Benoit Legrand at, at ING, each people that I think uh, with some profile have achieved a lot of success and, and have indeed had uh, some substantive tenure at their respective firms. And this journalist quite rightly pointed out, well, yeah, you're talking about people that have got Neil Cro um, that have got Piyush Gupta in the case of, um, of DBS and Ralph Hamers um, now stepping down and moving to UBS, obviously, but has been the CEO at ING. The, the, the two examples I gave were firms that had uh, forward-looking CEOs who were very much champions of this change and, uh, and very much supported it and drove it through the organisation. And I think that's absolutely right. And, and I think it's ti timely that you'll see there on the, the slide here that we quote Chris Skinner, a uh, notable author who recently published his book, Doing Digital. And he joined us on a, a, a webinar recently to, to launch this report. And one of Chris's observations, you know, he, he did his, his study looking across uh, DBS, ING, BBVA, JP Morgan and uh, China Merchants Bank. And the common theme he saw there was that where digitisation is, is done successfully, it's where the CEO has been very genuine about it, has not viewed it simply as an additional channel, but has viewed it as something that is fundamental to the overall outlook for the firm. And in particular, in his words, that they're not just trying to do innovation theatre, but that they are genuinely pushing a, a digitisation or innovation agenda, overhauling much of the firm. The other point I want to add to that is, I think there's a clear need to have multiple champions of change that we uh, are not relying on just having a great chief innovation officer with a CEO who says, go and do it, but rather that you need to have embedded across the organisation um, people that are uh, the promoting uh, advocates uh, and also that you're having success stories and, uh, and you, your quick wins along the way that are able to be the items that demonstrate success uh, and are able to then help uh, bring others along on the journey. That probably segues a little bit to culture and uh, and and if we you know we should talk about talent and culture again reconciling that talent was uh, and specifically retention of talent was the number one internal challenge that we'd identified. Um, 
But if I talk, talk first a little bit about culture, and, and one thing that really struck me here was there was a great example given to us by a, a chief innovation officer in the US who quoted the example of uh, the book uh, Relax to Win, which was written by a, a track and field coach, Bud Winter. Uh, Bud Winter was the coach of Tommy Smith and John Carlos, who, of course, were the, the two African-American athletes who did the famous Black Power salutes uh, on the dais at uh, Mexico City in 1968. Um, as an Australian, I'm very proud that Peter Norman from Australia was the guy who got in between them and got the silver medal. Uh, and Peter Norman, its uh, record, uh, national record for the 200 metres actually still stands today, uh, over 50 years later. But the great success of, of Tommy Smith and John Carlos in Bud Winter's eyes was that he had, uh, his philosophy was you train at 85%. You train at 85% of capacity and you leave yourself that scope to be able to refresh and be creative, extend, push in whatever way beyond that. And I thought it was a really interesting analogy that we had a, a chief innovation officer at a, at a major US firm citing that specific example and citing that philosophy of, you know, let's, and in his connectivity to, to the office was, you need to make sure that everybody is loaded up to work at 85% so that they've got a little bit of capacity, a little bit of headroom to complement that where they can experiment and where they can be creative. Um, because you will not get the creative culture if everybody is overloaded. Um, and I think Google have actually identified something of a, of a similar philosophy, um, which we captured in the report as well. Um, I'll just make a couple of quick comments on talent, and then again, I'll, I'll pause and, and invite Yako's reactions. But I made that comment earlier that the when we talked about the challenges, that a lot of the, the younger millennial staff, the new talent, has been very much about wanting to ensure that there is a sense of the purpose of the company that they work with, and also a sense of being able to work with the new tools and variety. And so one of the most significant things we saw as a success story quoted by a number of firms was where they'd been able to uh, institute programs that rotated their young uh, talent, particularly in the area of, of data scientists and the like, so that they were rotating through different parts of the firm, being exposed to different parts of the business, uh, to different customer bases, to different tool sets. Uh, and it was, a real, I think, a very strong emphasis on the need to have this you know, rotational approach to, to ensure that, uh, that, that, that uh, the talent is being exposed um, and having its opportunity to exercise its creative nous in, in different areas uh, and to, uh, in particular, avoid any sense of, of them becoming stale. Um, but again, why don't I, I pause here and, uh, Yako, if I can invite your reactions on any, either of those points or any of those points. Thank you, Brad. Yeah, I think there's actually quite a lot that one can add to this. Um, I think on the, on the point of multiple champions, I think that's a, a really important one. Um, it is impossible to have a command control structure and rely solely on that as part of your digital transformation process. You, you, you ought to have a strong model of co-creation where you have multiple champions that drive forward. Let's, if we call it, for example, the new paradigm, it's, it's all about co-creation, networks of connectivity that's dynamic, moving away from boundaries and confinement to um, almost like instant integration and interaction across the organization. And, and that, in order to achieve that, you, you need to change the, the DNA of the organization to be one of co-creation rather than just looking up at one or two individuals to, to drive that. Now, obviously, the, um, the role of the CEO and leadership is really important in setting the tone here. Um, but I think their role is changing from being one that accumulates the power to one that is actually facilitating this change. Uh, and for me, that's an important um, differentiator. And I think also as far as talent is concerned, you will then find that employees who enjoy the freedom of creation uh, will thrive in an environment where it's much less command control and much more co-creation because they want to be part of dynamic teams. Um, so so I, I think it's important to understand that in order to attain success. Um, I think traditionally have been much more command control and tech companies have been more co-creation type models. So it will be interesting to see how those things converge uh, going forward. Absolutely. Uh, Jakob, it's probably also a good point for us to, to uh, talk about the, uh, the another question that's come through to us. Um, that deals a bit to this point about talent and specifically in terms of risk talent. 
Uh, it's a great question. Do you worry that with social distancing or working from home, that this will cause, at least in the short term, a vacuum of new risk talent? That firms are can cancelling graduate and internship schemes as they're not able to spend the time to invest in people online. Uh, surely this will cause a problem a few years down the line. Ultimately, it's all about investing in future talent and leaders, and I'm worried this will become an issue. It's a great question, and, and uh, uh, I, I will add one further point to it you know, as an anecdote. You know, speaking with uh, with one of my former colleagues in Australia earlier this week, he uh, shared the anecdote from talking with recruiters that they'd found that a lot of firms were reluctant to hire people online just in terms of the um, that they weren't yet comfortable with the online recruiting process and the notion of, of hiring people via interviewing them via channels like this. I must say at the IAF, we've actually done that. We have hired a couple of people uh, that have started with us and I've been on boarded purely through... Uh, uh, including one of my staff who I've actually never met in person, um, but she's been terrific working with us via Zoom and, and WebEx on a daily basis. But clearly there's some reluctance that some others have uh, in that hiring process. And I guess it's to the extent that I think working from home is working very, very well for existing teams. There is a challenge perhaps in how you onboard and embed new staff um, in some job functions at least. But Yako, if we take that question, you know, do you have any thoughts or any concerns there about, um, you know, what this may mean when we reflect in the longer term on on what this period has meant for the develop the onboarding and development of young risk talent? Yeah, so so I think it will have an impact. Uh, however, I think it will be short term. Uh, what we see is that there is definitely uh, significantly more supply of risk talent currently, especially from the graduate space, than we can accommodate. Um, we we clean some of them, but we have reduced capacity, uh, or, or reduced the number simply because we don't have capacity to onboard all of them. I think that will change as we exit lockdown. We'll probably normalise again. Uh, but I think as the industry, you, you'll probably find for at least the next two years that they will more supply than demand. Um, and thereafter, I think you, you may uh, enter a period of a shortage again. Uh, I also think it takes quite a bit of time to invest in re these resources, so maybe yes. it won't be that, that big an issue uh, in the long run. That's a good point, and certainly you do see that uh, obviously risk leaders are, are time poor right at the moment when they've had so many new circumstances to deal with and uh, and the time to invest in, in recruitment and onboarding and, and uh, upskilling people is, is um, hopefully something that will become better in the future than it is uh, right now. I've got a couple of slides here I want to run through reasonably quickly because I want to make sure that we give uh, sufficient time for Yako to talk a bit more about the, the big paradigm shift. Um, if I can uh, pick out uh, a couple of the other key enablers, and this is from looking a bit at the, the external ecosystem. I said at the outset that our, our third report uh, between the IF and Deloitte will look at the external ecosystem and, and we'll talk more about data regimes and the like as we develop that report. But in this second report a couple of weeks ago, we did touch on what are some of the things internally that firms can be doing in how they engage with some of those uh, external entities, um, with very much an emphasis on where there is the opportunity for proactive collaboration, and also perhaps where there's a need for educating or upskilling some of the uh, external counterparties. And I'll just touch on a couple of points out of here quickly. I think on the regulatory and supervisory side, yeah, it needs to be stressed that from all of the engagements that we've had at the IAF, whenever we've been taking out the insights from our surveys of our member firms around the world about cloud or about machine learning, you know, I've often characterised that the, the attitude from regulators has been one of, of, uh, of being anxious to learn more. So I think supervisors have been anxious to upskill themselves and to learn more and engage more around the adoption of new technology. Um, in some cases, they are lagging perhaps where the more uh, advanced or innovative firms are at. And, and I know that's a point of frustration that some people call out. But I do give the regulators the credit for, for seeking and, and trying to progress in this space. And I think they've become even more open and receptive through the, the current crisis. Um, there was an interesting point that some of the people we interviewed called out about. Oh, well, we've labelled it here the adversarial history, which is probably overstating it a little, but um, it was explained to us in some cases that it depends very much if you're going to collaborate with your regulator, you know, who it is at the regulator that you're actually collaborating with, and that in some cases that can be very productive, and in other cases you're trying to collaborate with the person who might be looking over your shoulder trying to catch you out, as, as, uh, as a couple of them termed it. So there's an interesting piece there, but I, I think it reinforces that you know, the banks do need to be 
uh, proactive and in collaborating with regulators. And one point that was really stressed by a major bank uh, chief innovation officer in Europe was you need to take your subject matter experts with you when you go and talk to the regulators, um, that otherwise you fall back into that problem that Neil Cross talked about of perhaps having a perception that the regulator won't let you do something when that's actually not the issue at all. Um, but if you if your subject matter experts are three arms removed from the, the dialogue with the regulators, you expose yourself to that risk and that you need to take your subject matter experts directly for the that engagement. Um, I might touch on big tech platforms just as the, the other point I might uh, quickly touch on out of this slide. And again, I, I do so with the COVID overlay in that, you know, I think there's a really important uh, shift within the, the tech firm landscape that's occurring right now. And one is in particular that the tech firms, are, the big tech firms, I think, are, are, are big and more critical than ever. They're continuing to generate revenues through the crisis. As Yako said earlier, you don't waste a good crisis. And I think you know, we see that those firms are becoming more embedded in, in life. They're more uh, crucial as part of the health uh, solution uh, for a lot of the governments. And I also think of the lesson of Alibaba uh, really emerging in the 2002 to 2004 period during SARS as e-commerce came to the fore and a lot of people in the affected countries wanted to avoid having hand-to-hand um, -hand or face-to-face -face contact. And I think we see that being very much amplified and uh, I'll certainly put my hand up and say that there's an Amazon box arriving at my house just about every day at the moment. Um, so I think there is, is, you know, we need to be conscious of the notion that the, the tech firms I think are uh, likely to emerge bigger, stronger, more embedded than ever. And that impacts the uh, the nature of partnerships, perhaps, that banks or insurers may engage with those firms, that perhaps the, the, the balance of power or dynamic uh, shifts. And amongst the smaller fintech firms, you know, some of them that uh, if you're well advanced, if you've already got a, a well advanced product, if you've already got uh, partnerships in place, then uh, you may uh, be able to weather the crisis very effectively, but it's not a good not a good time to be at a, an early stage or a pre early stage development. And we have seen obviously that some of the smaller fintech firms have had their funding um, enter new challenges uh, over the course of the last couple of months. So, I just wanted to share those couple of observations, and I might, Yako, I might just continue with the the next uh, couple of slides we have on COVID. And again, I'll, I'll pause and then hand to you to to talk about the new paradigm. Uh, paradigm shift. You know, I think some of the fundamentals of, of COVID and what that's meant for digital transformation, I think in a lot of cases, it reiterates the things that we've already talked about. Um, the potential to be able to remove some of the blockages uh, or barriers uh, or inertia that have previously existed. I think it amplifies the urgency, the, um, the essential nature of being able to ensure continuity of customer service, um, being able to keep pace with those customer expectations. Uh, the point about the rapid adoption that we talked about in Megan Green's analogy earlier. But I will just pick out two other things that I'll mention. And, and one is about the uh, the opportunity that I think emerges with digital identity. Uh, and in particular that, you know, we have seen a number of governments already moving very quickly. Just yesterday, I spoke with Torsten Kleinbuning, the, the Chief Risk Officer of Deem Finance in Dubai. And he talked about how the UAE pass has suddenly been approved to accept digital signatures, something that would never have occurred in the past. Um, I think you also see that, that for a lot of banks, the opportunity to leverage their capabilities in digital identity as part of the new ecosystem post-COVID, I think just comes to the fore. And I think probably for the last eight weeks, just about every conversation that, that we've had at the IEF has gravitated in some way to digital identity. Um, if we have time at the end, I might touch on a, another initiative we have mobilising in that space. The other point I wanted to, to touch on is about uh, AI, artificial intelligence or machine learning. And I want to mention this from two angles. One that I think the experience through COVID is going to see that that technology is more embedded and more accepted. Um, that machine learning is being used as part of a lot of the health solution, the development of treatment plans, uh, as part of the vaccine development. And I think that leads to ultimately society becoming more comfortable with that technology. Um, but it's not necessarily easy in its application through a time when you suddenly have very um, uh, amended, um, uh, very amended landscape. I'll give one example, and, and this was written up in risk.net um, probably about six weeks ago, that where a lot of banks are using machine learning techniques as part of their fraud detection regimes. Of course, there's algorithms looking through transactions. Uh, those algorithms are trained on data points that might be six or 12 or 18 months old. And suddenly the transaction sets that they're observing 
uh, bear no resemblance to the world of six months ago. That everything is card not present transactions uh, or contactless transactions. And so, um, you know, there is a, I think, a, a piece there or a challenge there where the use of those technologies for very sound risk management purposes may have a little bit of shaking out period here where you know, we need the data sets to develop and catch up, just given how rapid the shift through uh, March, April uh, was in the, the nature of the profile. But again, I'll, I'm going to pause, uh, Yako, and I'll let you react to, to some of what I've described there, perhaps before you move on to talk about the, the paradigm shift. Yeah, so Brad, I think you've, you've summarized that quite well, and we've touched on many of these before. So let me maybe just move on to the other slides. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as before, I wrote a book in January. It's really a collation of my thoughts on all the mega trends that's happening. Um, it is quite interesting to see how many of those are starting to play out. Uh, subsequent to me um, writing those down. You can actually download a free copy of that uh, publication I've created. You'll see the link on the slide, newparadigmfinance.com. Uh, in this book, I cover a number of uh, topics. Um, it's a complex read, so it's not something uh, uh, that will compete with your, one of your favorite novels. Um, there's a couple of key domains where um, uh, you will note that I've highlighted key changes. So it's in finance. So from a perspective, there are a number of mega trends that, um, that is basically uh, at the point of uh, reaching the end of, of the unsustainable trends. Um, I think what we're seeing with uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown, um, it's changing things probably forever. Uh, it's still early days as far as how uh, I see the financial uh, paradigm shift playing out. Uh, many are optimistic that uh, post-lockdown uh, we will see a reversion back to uh, the old uh, paradigm, the old normal uh, pre the crisis. I don't think that will ever happen. Um, the second uh, uh, category where uh, I think in the technology and the platform space, which I'll briefly touch on, and thirdly, in the people space, is how people actually um, work, uh, how they engage with each other, how they look at their wellness. I, I think there's some significant shifts to take place there. Um, what you will see on this slide is uh, a comparison between, uh, as I mentioned before, the analog world and the quantum world. Um, I think it, what's important to understand here is that the quantum world is not new. Uh, the discovery and application of the quantum world is new. Uh, humans are very sophisticated biological quantum processes. Um, experience life is all based on the mechanics, even though people don't always recognize that. Uh, if you look at technology such as the laser, the internet, even your mobile device, uh, social media, they all built on the principles of quantum mechanics. So we have already adopted those to a large extent. Uh, quantum computing, I think, is still pretty new, and it's got some way to go before there's widespread adoption. Um, I, I think, however, what you need to note is that when humanity adopts a new set of technology, it fundamentally changed the way we engage and operate with each other. Um, therefore, you can't uh, have management structures, performance structures, uh, uh, and the likes that continues to operate on the old paradigm if you are starting to adopt technology that forces you in a new paradigm. Um, and what you will see on this slide is that the difference between the analog world and the quantum world is vast. In uh, a number of these ca cases, these are absolutely mind-bending stuff. So if you look at things like in the quantum world, uh, different states exist at the same time. It is absolutely inconceivable for most humans to even contemplate that. Yet a laser um, is exactly doing that, where um, the particles exist in different states at the same time. Um, also, what you see in the analog world is you have things like confinement, whereas in the quantum world, there's no boundaries. Um, in the analog world, things tend to be binary. Uh, in the quantum world, all probabilities at the same time. 
Um, so what you can see from this, the difference is stark. It's it's very significant. And one may think that the quantum world is, is something of the future, and we don't need to worry about that now. Actually, that is not the case. And if you look at the next slide, you can actually see that these things are starting to happen already. Um, what the lockdown has done actually to speed that up. Um, so as an example, we used to work in office environment where it was all based on confinement. You self-actualized in your little cubicle with your desk and your pot plant and your photo next to that. All of a sudden, you can work anywhere, uh, any location, any country. Uh, we used to be organized very much along formal team structures. Uh, what this lockdown has done and the crisis around that, it, it has forced uh, companies and industries to work together across different paradigms and collaborate across, um, basically fundamentally changing the way we work. I think that's necessarily back, back to the old ways. I think post lockdown, we will see some of the old dynamics still play out because humans still need to engage with each other. They cannot engage with each other over computer screens all the time. However, what will happen is you will find that increasingly there's going to be a lot more flexibility in terms of how we work. And people are getting used to the fact that they can work anywhere. Um, you will also find that information has mentalized. That is changing very rapidly. Uh, and increasingly, you will find um, information will flow across boundaries, uh, not only within the bank, but also outside the bank uh, to third parties and to regulators. Um, I, I spend a bit of time on that in the book, but, but I think that fundamentally will have a very significant impact on business models and the way we operate. Um, if you look at the, the principles of a quantum world, it's all about information that's available across the spectrum. That does bring about the questions around ethics and how you actually make use of the data and maintain the trust of your customer base. Um, and then I think uh, just two other points I want to highlight here is that um, traditionally the networks of commerce has been based on face-to-face -face interaction between humans that has very rapidly changed to a model where the interaction is based on digital ch channels. And the mere fact that having this discussion um, is testimony to that. Um, previously, it would have been impossible for me to participate in this conference, uh, setting two hours aside, uh, without having to travel to Europe, as an example. Now, mm -hmm. I can do it from the convenience of my home. So I, I think that is a very fundamental change, um, not only for, for conferences, but also uh, for people who want to contribute uh, and make the skills and expertise available to a wider um, uh, customer base. And we're already doing that. We find, for example, that we make use of specialist consultants uh, that are US-based. Uh, historically, we had to like pre-plan when they come out uh, they need to fly out to South Africa, they jet lagged. Um, it's difficult to coordinate the meetings. And now it's just so easy. It's a click of the button. They participate in the discussions online and they can even give feedback to, to key chief committees online because it's just so easy to do that. So I think um, not only does, does it open up a whole new world in terms of how you engage with your your uh, your suppliers and, and your business partners, but we may even end up in a world where the traditional boundary of employment may change, where people are not necessarily just working for one company anymore. They may actually work across and, and work in a co-creation way, providing their skills and expertise. So, so I think all very exciting. Um, what I want to do with these two slides is just to show you how significant this paradigm shift is that's starting to happen. I think it's still early, um, early days in terms of uh, all these change. Um, a lot of what I've written in my book will probably play out over the next couple of years, but, but, but I think it's important that people understand that we need to start thinking differently because the world is changing very rapidly around us. Um, and we can't continue to think uh, with a mindset that's stuck in the old ways. It, it simply won't work. Um, analog thinking will not work in a digital and a quantum world. It, it simply will clash. Um, and organizations can't afford that because that all that will do is create a conflict and, and politics inside the organization. 
Um, yeah, Brad, so I think those are the key points I want to highlight here. Um, these are complex topics. We can spend days talking about this, and I'm happy to also engage with anyone uh, offline on a one-on-one -on -one basis who would like to discuss these, these uh, topics in detail. Yeah, okay. Well, I think you've been been very generous to the the risk management uh, community broadly around the world in in taking the time to share your insights and putting them into this book that, uh, as you've said, is is freely available uh, at the website there. Um, you've been a little bit hard on yourself in saying that it's uh, uh, not a, not an easy read or not equivalent to your uh, your, your latest novel. Um, maybe it's not a Tom Clancy spy novel, but uh, I've got to tell everybody I found it a very easy read and I very, definitely recommend it. I, I sat down and read it in one Sunday afternoon. Uh, and what I think is really striking is that, that you know, when Yako wrote this pre-COVID, uh, and I think it's probably fair to say, Yako, that you'd identified a lot of the conditions around the world that would at times trigger some sort of paradigm shift without necessarily pinpointing when it would be or, or what, what, what might necessarily be the trigger, but that these things were coming in some time unspecified form. And of course, what's happened very quickly is that it's happening. Uh, and so I, I definitely recommend the read to everybody in a context that if you do read it right now, you on one hand will, will see a lot that resonates with what has happened in the last three or four months. It gives you a, a good grounding in the, the here and now. But as Yako says, these are changes that are, are not going to happen instantly and that they are going to take two or three or four years to embed. So the book is both a good grounding in the current circumstances as well as a good foreshadowing of some of these really dramatic shifts to, to be thinking of. Um, I want to add two more things to, to that. I think firstly, you know, Yako, when you've talked there a bit about being able to interact with people through channels like this and how it breaks down some of those geographic barriers uh, and the like, one thing that I think as as, uh, as a global workforce we're all going to have to, to develop on is, is some of the soft skills of you know, how do you ensure that you're presenting yourself in a way that genuinely enables you to connect best, both how does your, your skills of things like active listening, how does that change in this setting as opposed to a face-to-face -face setting? You know, I think some of those soft skills, human skills, are things that we're all going to improve at over time and adapt with over time. Um, uh, it was a really interesting point that uh, Alex Gregorian of Equifax made recently that, you know, there is this new vulnerability that comes with the, the camera. It may be a career expert who had his kids wander in and ambush him in the background a year or two ago, and that was so remarkable at the time, and it's so every day now. Um, but there is, I guess, an adaptation for us all as we um, get comfortable with that and, and comfortable with the vulnerability of that camera on culture and, and the soft skills that, that we need to accommodate that. The other point I want to mention, and, and you framed this, obviously, Arco, in terms of the quantum world, not necessarily quantum computing, but I do want to talk about quantum computing for a moment. Um, and we had an IIF webinar on this topic last week, and there was a great point made by uh, Michael Brett of Rigetti Computing. Firstly, that quantum computing is a, a cloud-first technology, and it's the, the firms that are cloud-enabled that are best positioned to be able to, to make the leap with quantum uh, or to utilise quantum to its, to its full capacity. Um, that quantum is also an enabler for better and more advanced artificial intelligence. But also I think there's a notion that, that, that came up in that discussion about the encryption and the, the security risks. And, and one point was made that you have um, uh, bad actors around the world or perhaps rogue states that will be looking at some stage to use quantum to, as a means of breaking encryption. And the scary thing is that what some of those bad actors are doing is that they are, are looking to, to steal data sets now data sets that they can't open now, but they're looking to steal them now with the anticipation that they'll be able to use quantum technology to, to crack those you know, two or three years from now, um, which just adds to, I guess, some of the sense of the security risk that we, we need to be uh, cognizant of. I realise we're hitting time. I think probably for our last minute, Yako, if we can just pick up the point that you alluded to about uh, data ethics um, and, and, and data ethics and trust that was a key theme you touched on, and, and I think it's a, a really important issue. And I'll just call up this slide, which is from the, the Bank of England's Future of Finance report from June last year. Great report, which I highly recommend. In fact, it's almost 12 months to the day, I think, that it was published. Um, but it was a great snapshot here of a survey where people have been asked, what type of company do you most trust with your data? And you can see overwhelmingly it's banks ahead of a number of those other alternatives. And, and Yako, perhaps if I can just give you the final word before we wind up and hand back to Eleanor, but 
you know, I think there's, yeah, and you allude to this in your book about you being able to demonstrate the ethical use of data as perhaps being a differentiator uh, in the new economy, but equally that you need to be able to protect that trust and that it only takes some bad, bad uh, examples in the use of data that you can erode that trust very quickly. Can I get you just to make a, perhaps a final quick comment on that before we hand back to Eleanor to close? Yeah, so so I think this is a, a really important point for success for, for banks going forward. So if you look at the big difference between banks and technology companies is that banks provide the service, they charge for that service, and as part of the service, they collect a lot of valuable data. Technology companies um, provide a service they don't charge in order for them to monetize the value they sell uh, basically the data um, of you as a customer so if you don't know who's the customer you are the, uh, if you don't know who what's the product you are pro probably the product that is basically how the technology companies work um, the challenge with that is that it creates significant conflict of interest from ethical use of data perspective um, and I think that's the one area where banks still have a significant advantage uh, ahead of the technology companies. Banks are trusted, and they will probably be trusted for quite some time. Uh, if they continue to improve their service offerings and their platforms to be efficient, to meet the customer requirements, and they can retain that, they are, are probably end up ahead of the technology companies. But if they don't get those things right, the technology companies can get it. Um, I think we will see more convert between uh, platforms and service offerings over time. But I think the key differentiator would be trust and ethical use of data going forward. And therefore, I, th I think the banks are in the business of trust. So this is the one ball that we cannot afford to drop. Totally agree. I'm conscious we've hit time. There's a lot more I'd love to talk about on this subject, and there's a great initiative at the IF that we're running with the Open ID Foundation on, on uh, open digital trust, uh, which we encourage anyone to, to get in contact with us about. But we are over time, so Eleanor, I'd better hand back to you and let you close. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, a really, really interesting presentation. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to our presenters, Brad and Yako, for joining us today for a really thought-provoking and engaging presentation. And also to everybody who tuned in, thank you so much. This webinar will also be available on demand afterwards. If you do have any feedback on today's discussion or any recommendations for future webinars, please do just complete our short survey. It should flash up very uh, shortly on your screens. Also, for the latest updates on RiskMinds events, both face-to-face -face and digital, please do follow the RiskMinds pages on LinkedIn and Twitter. Until we meet again, stay safe and thank you very much. Thank you, Brad, and thank you, Yako, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.